Hey there. Hi. How are you? Good. We got it going. I always get a little nervous at that moment when I'm adding someone on. <laughs> right. And then I was like, okay, I want to make sure that you can hear me okay. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for being here. So um, I'm going to let some people join us before we get started. I'm going to try my best to keep an eye on the on the comments. So in case people have questions as we're talking, what you're feel free to put them in the in the chat. Okay. All, right. All right. So let's see, we'll give it a couple more more seconds here. Are you at home right now? Or are you joining us from home? Yeah, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, make and do. I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we can get started. Um, I'm just gonna let everyone know how Kamali and I know each other. We happen to live in the same town and we've connected through some initiatives related to diverse, diversity and equity and inclusion in the school systems. And Kamali found out that I was doing this series and she so generously reached out and asked if she could participate. So I'm very excited to have you here and I'm going to let you take it from here and introduce yourself and share about your background. I'm so eager to learn. <laughs> uh, well, so thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I think, remember the first time that we met was over a um, conference call uh, or a Zoom call as usual. And um, when I learned about your work with uh, nutrition, um, it really intrigued me. And so we just kind of kept having some more conversations since then. Yeah. But um, just to kind of tell uh, folks a little bit more about me, I, re I moved to Massachusetts about five years ago. Um, I spent most of my time growing up in New York. Um, and before that, I am a um, first generation American. Um, both of my parents are Jamaican. Um, I spent some time growing up there as a child. I went to um, what you would call basic school um, there, which would be the equivalent of maybe like kindergarten, first grade, second grade here. And, um, you know, once I came back to New York, I um, would frequently travel back and forth to Jamaica, usually every summer. Um, I'm the oldest of four, mm -hmm. and um, the frequency was pretty consistent when it was just the two of us. My brother and I are very close in age, and uh, then uh, we have uh, two younger sisters, and things had to kind of decrease after that, I right? Can't so, <laughs> um, but um, I did really um, after you know, I think in, I spent my time in high school in New York. Um, I would lived in a very um, west indian uh neighborhood yeah so we had um you know if whatever island you could name um i was surrounded by that um and but then encompassed in that was just um you know the older generation of italian americans um we had a newer population of um, people from the african um, continent that were coming to our neighborhood and I think that we see a lot of that um, still happening today. Um, we have a big Albanian population in this kind of Northeast section of the Bronx as well. Um, so it's, it's changed over time. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, we always had kind of a um, exposure to different um, parts of the U.S. and also we had an option, op ability to travel to Canada and see our family in England and that always just kind of sparked in me that there's such a big world out there and I want to go mm -hmm. see it mm -hmm. and, and why not um, and I think that when I went to college um, in upstate New York and I had an opportunity to do a study abroad I was like I have to do this um, and each time that, 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 so that was another opportunity where I got to travel and I spent, um, I did that year in Europe and did a lot of travel when we had breaks. And also, um, you know, once I, I, I studied engineering at school and the type of role that I entered in my career afterwards allowed me the opportunity to travel throughout Asia 
um, afterwards. And that was like another, like, okay, this, it, there's more of this world that I'm interested in that I want to see. Um, and since we're talking about nutrition, food was, you know, okay, let me, I want to try this and I want to see what this tastes like. And you could see how, even though we thought we were so different, there were so many similarities in all of these different regions that we travel to. Like, like what? I'm curious. Um, okay. So, um, for, for, um, example, um, when you in in Taiwan, which is where I spent a lot of, of my time in my twenties, um, you have um, what you call a night market, which is mm -hmm. kind of like a shopping, food, uh, and entertainment uh, mm -hmm. outdoor vibe. And while you're there, you see all these different um, m meals um, that you like finger foods. Yeah. But um, the average eye would kind of be shocked to just see like. Um, um, duck hanging or um, chicken feet or mm -hmm. um, tofu on a, on a popsicle stick. But, you know, how are you preparing that? And um, for me, like growing up as a child, and even to this day, you know, you can make soup with a lot of these same ingredients. So mm -hmm. um, the like chicken foot soup would be a staple. That mm -hmm. would be something that you could encounter in both um, Caribbean culture mm -hmm. um, and the Asian culture. Um, then I would also see um, it was very meat heavy, mm -hmm. meat and fish heavy. Mm -hmm. um, fruits, of course, as well, but very meat and fish heavy. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until I started to like do more travel around parts of uh, Europe that I saw, I started to learn more about the lentils and um, different types of, um, of beans mm -hmm. um, that can be made into um, a, a sauce or mm -hmm. a soup. Um, or like a curry. I know that curry is very popular in England. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that, think if you just, using your example, right, of curry, um, the, how, how, you know, you associated that with England, but it's really India too. Yeah, in mm -hmm. India. But right, because of the colonization that happened from the UK going to India and also to the Caribbean islands, um, you bring these spices there. And then mm -hmm. each place that you go to then kind of uses them and seasons them differently. Mm -hmm. So it has like, um, as, a, as an adult, I've um, had a chance to really build more relationships with um, uh, people from India, Southeast Asia, and we we'll often talk about how Jamaican curry versus Trinidadian curry versus Indian curry. And the differences are so slight. Yeah. Um, and the similarities, there are more similarities than differences, right? Um, so I really love that, you know, we can appreciate each other's culture, the food, and learn from each other. Because Absolutely. now all of, yeah, it's, it's just, and then one of the things that I found living in Massachusetts is that my particular town may not have a heavy um, population of um, West Indian and Caribbean mm -hmm. um, residents or shops, but shout out to the Brazilian crew, you know, Definitely. shout out to my, um, mm -hmm. my, my Hispanic neighbors, Latino friends and family, because, you know, I can go to some of their markets and get the ingredients that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. um, I can go to a lot of the, um, the Indian and Asian mm -hmm. markets and get the ingredients that I'm looking for mm -hmm. in bulk, right? Yeah. I don't need to go to Whole Foods to buy coconut that I'm going to use in a lot of my meals, right? right. I can right. go to um, these markets that are heavily focused on our food culture and know mm -hmm. that it's something that we're going to use in abundance. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, are they are the are the item are the products less expensive if you you know than they would be at for instance Whole Foods? Um, yeah, they they are more mm -hmm. less expensive, and um, I think the things that we're looking for is um, um, so my and <laughs> it's funny because you know I have um, I'm the mom of three kids. And um, they very much are involved in the cooking process. So sometimes, you know, we would just prefer to buy the whole coconut husk and um, break that coconut, 
then you have water, coconut water, one ingredient. Then you have the, um, the flesh the, the, that we would then use to, um, we could grater it. Um, we could cut it up and make it into candies that we would call mm -hmm. drops. This mm -hmm. is a combination of coconut, ginger, and brown sugar. That sounds delicious. Um, yeah. Uh, my neighbors have uh, had the for good fortune of having some of what uh, we can't consume in the house. <laughs> and um you know so you would you i would get that ingredient and then whereas if i would go to maybe a regular supermarket um you know they would be um maybe older dried out because they're not being frequently purchased or consumed okay. and so i'd have to as a default get the shredded coconut that's in a bag or that's frozen so that's, that's like your, you know, your alternate, but yeah. fresher is always our preference. Well, it's interesting because I, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is this concept of these, these markets that sound like they've got a variety of fresh local ingredients. Like my guess is that these, you know, when you're seeing a chicken or you're seeing chicken feet or you're seeing produce that it's pretty fresh. Yeah. Right. Um, or maybe not. I don't know. Another example is, um, because it is the, your clientele are using it very frequently, you're constantly getting in the shipments and that's mm -hmm. why. So um, if we're looking to purchase um, oxtail or a beef for a soup or um, you might use, it, you know, some people will buy beef stock in a mm -hmm. box or in a mm -hmm. can and you can just buy the beef bones, boil them down and make mm -hmm. your stock that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I would go to say my um, uh, a Latinx market that I know in Framingham. Shout out to Tesoro. Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody else goes there. But I would go there. I would drive into Boston and go to those markets and get those ingredients. You stock up on them. Mm -hmm. You have them in your freezer. And when you decide to make that dish, you pull it out. Um, or if you know, okay, I'm going to make it this weekend, you would um, go there and, and you'd get them. Um, that is something that maybe you have to call ahead at a more um, typical supermarket in this area. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I just know. wanted to write down to Soro because um, <laughs> when I post this video, I want to make sure if there's any, you know, sh you know, links we want to include okay. or, you know, to, to local markets that we do that because that's really helpful and valuable. I have, um, I know a friend of mine who's from um, Belarus and she, has told me all about the Russian market in Framingham and I've gone there and the food is just really fresh. And I know sometimes you can get ingredients for other kinds of cuisine there as well, but it's really great to know about these local Oh, I wish markets. that I knew more of the names. Um, there are some, uh, we prefer to buy whole fish. Yeah. Um, if I'm making a fish, we would steam it or fry it. Mm -hmm. um, or we would do something called escovich. Mm -hmm. which is kind of the um, way that you're prepare you're seasoning it, you, you fry it, and then you would season it with some onions, vinegar, and spices afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, to buy that whole fish, there are only very few um, um, seafood markets that are local that you could get them at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Jamaican, so we, we tend to lean on the side of buying snapper. Mm, um, awesome. But the way that the market prices <laughs> look these days, sometimes you have to, you know, stick to tilapia or get something different. Um, yeah. But there's um, definitely several shops that um, yeah. maybe afterwards I could share. Yeah, afterwards, just you, you can send them to me and I can add yeah. them to um, the comment, uh, yeah. the description section or the comments in the link. Um, mm -hmm. That that it's really great to know about those like places where you can explore other cuisines that are more local, and it really it's fascinating to hear about your experiences in all these different places you traveled and lived and having family in different countries, and it it did give you probably a really great insight into the different culture around food and then things that were similar. And I'm really curious, um, you know, what how you observe those experiences in the context of, of, um, you know, the U S culture around food and, and if there's any like things that, you know, are kind of different, similar. Um, um, I could say, for example, there's, 
I, I, sometime, and maybe it's a generational thing, but mm -hmm. there's a shared experience that um, I think I have culturally um, as one is a Jamaican, one is part of the broader Caribbean population where we grew up where there were certain dishes that you could expect throughout the week. Mm -hmm. It was almost like it was scheduled. It was like a regular so, rotation. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, Saturday was soup. Saturday, you're going to have a soup, um, you know, of any kind, whether it's going to be beef soup, chicken soup, you know, a vegetable soup, but you were going to have soup on Saturday because it, and, and now I think about it, right. It allowed the family to have a time to just like chill out, clean, do whatever you're doing in the house because soup is just going to brew itself throughout the day. Um, Sunday, you might have, it, it would be like a gathering day. So whoever is close by is coming over, going to stop by. And you would have more of a rice and peas, um, mm -hmm. chicken or beef. Um, you know, some people would have um, brown stew chicken, or you would have a, um, a jerk pork or mm -hmm. something of that. More of your heavier dishes would be on a Sunday, something that you would share with your friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, and then throughout the week, you know, as, as people were working, it was very kind of like simple, easy dishes. You always had a starch, a vegetable, and a, and a meat. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've um, really added to our food um, uh, repertoire in this house is just more vegetables. So mm -hmm. just heavier on the vegetable portion. Sometimes we can leave out the starches um, and, and when I say starches, I'll say we eat a lot of um, yams, potatoes, um, uh, cassava, mm -hmm. um, like root vegetables, mm -hmm. I guess they would be called or mm -hmm. deemed. Mm -hmm. And um, not, um, and a lot of, well, there's a saying that says, as long as you have flour and water, we're going to be okay. Because we can make a gazillion things out of <laughs> flour and water um if we have and and this pan this pandemic really showed us that uh, when uh you would go you know if you remember like like last year when our supermarkets were very kind of like squeezed for products the things that the average joe was not purchasing i could figure out how to <laughs> make something with that you can get very so, creative <laughs> yeah yeah so the, you know, there's a section of the supermarket that has plantains and um, it has all of the cassava. It might have um, like the um, used, the, the, the bruised, the bruised, slightly bruised um, vegetables and fruits. Uh -huh. No problem. That's I can great. do something with that. Yeah. Too. <laughs> uh, so those are those are sort of the things that um, definitely in the pandemic, we kind of helped see, the kids to see how remember those things that oh mommy do we have to have this again yeah um, you you for another thing uh, kind of in the rotation that you were going to have in your family uh meals was um it's called the jamaican national dish aki and saltfish okay and you're gonna have um aki is a oh, you just got a lot of likes on that one million <laughs> hearts coming up the screen <laughs> So that's, it, it's a, it's a fruit, um, but you can't consume it raw. You have to boil it and um, cook it properly. So wait, you said it was a fruit, but it has, it has fish in the name. Yes. So it's, it's a combination. It's okay. called, it's ackee is the fruit. And the most popular combination with that is saltfish. And it's simply cod, but it's salted cod. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I kind of like skimming over some things here, but if you think about that, the salted cod in an island setting, you didn't have refrigeration. Right. You know, right. it's not refrigeration is not available to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so how do you keep products that you have over time? You salt them, you um, you put them in a brine, um, which is often what we will do with like some pork dishes um, or some meat dishes. Or you would, um, the example I gave earlier about the fish, the escovitch, is um, that's another way that you are helping your food to last longer. Mm -hmm. because or, you know, it just made me think of ceviche in um, yes. Mex Mexico, and which I love, but it's like they cook it through the, the, the acidity of the lime and lime juice. 
Correct, correct. Right? They're similar to that. It's really interesting. So I want to pause because there's been a lot of comments that have come up and there's some that I wanted to just get back to. So so Jenna mentioned the Spice Hut in Framingham is a great place to get spices. Absolutely, absolutely. And she, uh, I'm not sure if it was her or another friend that mentioned that your daughter taught her how to bake bread or how to make bread, um, which is amazing uh, that your daughter, how old's your daughter? She is 10 at the time. She was nine. Wow. And um, everyone was on a bread baking kick over this um, pandemic. But an, a little side note to that is um, a popular bread in our culture is called hard oak bread. Mm -hmm. But it's actually very soft. So oh. it's kind of a little um, play on words. But okay. um, the way that you would prepare that is differently than, say, um, you know, your, your traditional sourdough bread or something like that. And um, luckily, we have the good fortune that our um, older cousin, um, he's like our, the senior cousin in our family, um, shout out to Rowan, he taught us how to bake um, hard oat bread um, several months before the pandemic. And perfect so timing. <laughs> it was perfect timing. And then we just kept going. And um, lo and behold, she was able to then get on Zoom and teach some other people how to do it. That is awesome. That, what a great thing for her to be doing during the pandemic, to be teaching cooking classes. I almost want to have her come on here and do it for us or, or do a Zoom for our clients because it is so great to be able to um, learn about different cuisines and um, explore that together. And you mentioned something earlier that I wanted to go back to too, this like the sense of connection and friends, the soup and the meals on the weekends that you remember. Uh, and I think I mean, that's something that I, I mean, I think, you know, it's just kind of at least here in the U.S. is eroded over time. I think it's it's more of a novelty. And we have to work really hard and be intentional about creating space for shared meals and connection around food and meals. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, like what you, you know, what how your cu culture is in terms of connecting around food. And um, if you bring that into your own, you know, your life today with your family. Um. One way that we connect around food, and I, this is another way that I feel like we're similar, is that um, there is almost, there's an auntie or an uncle that has a specialty in one particular item. And so I never heard of this word called potluck until I was in college. Yeah. But essentially, you know, you knew that your Aunt Joy was the expert at this item. Your aunt Audrey, <laughs> curry goat, she is the one that's gonna bring curry goat to the table. Um, you know, you knew that if you wanted a cake, that you would go to your, your aunt Bunchy. You, if you wanted um, a particular drink or Kool-Aid made, you needed to call um, Keisha and, and, you know, like there was always a specific person that was um, excellent at um, uh, several items. Yeah. And so you looked forward to getting together because you said, oh, I hope she brings, I hope he brings this thing or I hope this person brings this dip. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one way that um, we connected. Like they would literally come in the door and you'd say, hey, yeah. you know, and they put it on the table and you knew that that was going to be, um, you know, and, and it, 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 it actually, um, as you, as I made friends that were outside of my culture, um, and you bring them into your family setting, they also became familiar with who was excellent at what. Mm -hmm. And now you get the calls from your girlfriend saying, "Oh, is your aunt bringing that item? Can your aunt, <laughs> can your aunt make this for my?" I wife? love it. I love yeah. it, and it's such so. an expression of love and. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to be able to all have one thing you can, mm -hmm. you can potentially get really good at making and share and, and share that experience of bringing food together and connecting around food. Um, mm -hmm. I love it. I, you know, one thing, one thing that's really great as the weather gets warmer, um, that you can do more of that outside. Mm -hmm. And, um, I love that, um, any event turns into more than just, you know, we're going to have a meal and then go home. It turns into a card game. Mm -hmm. Dominoes get come out. Yeah. Um, we'll play um, Ludi, which is is a game that is um, has several names throughout the world. Yeah. Um, and then um, we'll you know, the music gets turned on. We we particularly feel that the food tastes better when you've got the music on. Now um, I was wondering about that when you're talking about the markets and. Um 
you know, in, in Jamaica and in, I think in, East, in Asia, where it, it had this vibe. Like I almost yeah. sense that like you're walking through there and there's music playing. Were there, was there live music often? Um, there would be music going on the, in the background. The night markets. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, there were, you know, maybe someone that was doing a, a, a game on the side, you know. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in New York, it was more like a, you know, three card Monty kind of thing. But um, in, um, from what I can recall, like um, in Taiwan, also in, in South Korea as well, it was like... Um, you know, the way that people go to the malls to just kind of like window shop. Yeah. It's like you go to the night market to window. It's outdoors, but you're like just looking at all the food, the options. Mm -hmm. You can purchase um, little trinkets. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a jewelry, a take home thing. Um, we one uh, someone just shared a comment. Um, yes, we definitely over time my in my Jamaican culture growing up, I think that we've kind of emerged away from that now, but <laughs> we were not really fond of, or we didn't grow up, I should say. I didn't grow up um, being exposed to eating out mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. restaurants eating. Mm -hmm. You did that at home. Mm -hmm. Like that's that goes back to the comment I was saying before that you always had a specialist in the family at something. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really have to go too far to get great mm -hmm any any anything mm -hmm. um and uh, ownership was a part of that too you know owning your own restaurants um owning your own shops um i come from a family that was um uh prominent in the community where we owned a small grocery shop mm -hmm. you sold um patties um you know, which have now become like such a staple that you could find them in any, um, a any, you know, national market in the frozen mm -hmm. section. But having a freshly baked patty come out mm -hmm. with some hard -o bread or cocoa bread on the side, mm -hmm. it's like, Sounds good. And so like what's, what, what are the ingredients in the patties? Um, it's, you could have a beef patty, mm -hmm. um, a chicken patty, mm -hmm. um, those would, in, in the 80s and 90s, that's really as far as you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Now there's probably 15 different um, varieties. So you can have a veg vegetable patty. So uh, is it, is it, it differs from like, I'm thinking of a hamburger. It's, it's different than that. So here, a patty is a great example of like cross-cultural like mm -hmm. mixes, right? Because it's a, uh, it's a fast food. Um, in the Latinx culture, you might call it a empanada. Mm -hmm. um it it's um you know so it's a breading on the outside a flaky crust on the outside okay. mm -hmm. with a filling on the inside okay and um my my husband's family has a great recipe for a peas patty which they mm -hmm. use um pigeon peas or mm -hmm. um what we refer to as gungu peas mm -hmm. so again like there's so many um that's another thing that i've found as as you travel you could look at an item and see that you know what that thing is, but it's called something different. Okay. Wherever you go. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a patty is definitely like a fast food, something you would want to get, grab on the go. So if you were in the market and someone had, you know, there was one freshly made, you might grab that as you're walking through. Or yeah. Okay. It's so it's a walk and talk kind yeah. of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it, but I love. You're, you're right. I think there it, that that the, the fast food culture is something that is more. Um, I don't want to say it's not unique anymore, but I think it evolved here because mm -hmm. of the need to, to do things fast. And I think through that, we do lose that, what you're describing is that connection around food, that making food with family, like having those special foods that are made with love and there's a sense of pride in them. And um, I do, I, I'm curious, it, it sounds like your family, you know, now does a lot of that. Like you take pride in, in, in making food and you're teaching your kids and you're bringing them into that whole shared experience around food which is is really wonderful so that's not something like that's something you've really adopted from your or brought in not adopted but brought in from your cultural background yeah i will share the live a couple of people have requested I'll, I'll promise i'll post it on our um our instagram um going back a little bit someone made a comment they wanted to see if you could distinguish between a yam and a sweet potato and i actually would not mind if you do because i've always just been like it's just a like a colloquial thing, like maybe some places they call them yams, some places they call them sweet potatoes, but I might be completely wrong. <laughs> um, 
Um, okay, I'm trying to think. So when you often have this conversation during the holidays mm -hmm. where um, um, you would make a sweet potato pie mm -hmm. and so you're in the store and you're going to look for sweet potato, but then you see something that says that's labeled yam. So um, the sweet potato that has the orange flesh, mm -hmm. um, that is, I think, a like very widely known as a, um, as a, called a, either a sweet potato or a yam. Mm -hmm. When I was referring to using that word yam, um, it is completely different. It is, um, it has a much um, coarse, a much more coarse outer um, shell. And um, oftentimes, if you're finding it in the um, the the Latin markets, it's going to be labeled as um, negro yam or um, blanco. Um, and what the the inside flesh is either yellow or white. Okay. And um, it has a it's it's not it's it's the texture is it is um harder than a potato per se but um n like definitely and definitely harder than um what you would call a sweet potato okay um i'm i don't know if i'm doing it justice right now but it it they, they're all all of those are all grown underneath the dirt they're you know not a kind of a vine um they don't grow on a vine. They're, mm -hmm. they're planted in the ground. Like root vegetables. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, Very interesting. Cause there, it sounds like within that, yeah, that class of vegetable, there are a lot of varieties and a lot of different colors. I'm just thinking of all the different colored yeah. um, potatoes. You get, you know, red potatoes, black potatoes, white potatoes, yellow potatoes. Mm -hmm. So I think there is probably that variation in color and some, and maybe culturally that did, it shifted the names depending on what was available. So it's interesting. I, um, but there's a lot of nutrient. Um, yeah. Those are, it's those root vegetables absolutely. are very nutrient packed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious, one of the things that you, you mentioned as we were preparing for this, if you sent me a little bit of information, you talked about how a lot of the traditional cultural foods in Jamaica are really tied to early poverty and slavery. And I'm, I'm, Wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, you, you you alluded to it a little bit with like the lack of refrigeration, and but maybe when things you know transitioned here and how those cultures kind of moved, those foods moved with people. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to hear more about that. Um. So one of the um the 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 yam that I was having a trouble describing to you, um, that we often eat. Um, that is a definitely a remnant of the, um the the transatlantic slave um process right because um enslaved africans brought these products that were familiar to them mm -hmm. and the people that were bringing them here said okay well we need them to eat and so they had these um some of these items or they kept the seeds and they when they came to these um island nations um mm -hmm. they began to kind of reproduce produce and you know um reap these same fruits vegetables etc mm -hmm. so there's definitely um things that you would see that are um were not native to that particular island because they were brought from uh various um you know other original nations okay. another item um Someone did share that the um, su Southern Americans eat the orange sweet potato okay. that we also refer to as candy canine, yams. canine yams. So I wonder if that was the influence, that African influence, do you think? Maybe that was like when you're talking um, about the yams or? No, I'm thinking that, um, you know, for example, you have um, something called jackfruit, which yes. is gaining mm -hmm. a lot of popularity now. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of my favorite fruits. Um, and we would often connect that to um, the the Caribbean, but it's actually probably rooted more in um, Asia and Africa than anything. Hmm. Um, so you can see how like they, the 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 fruits or the vegetables they traveled with with people. They came also over to these new nations. Mm -hmm. um, you have things like um, 
you know, when, when I was the, the question that you were talk, asking me about, you know, how do I connect the, how do I see that the, um, poverty and slavery is rooted in some of the foods that we are used to having. Um, we the, the dishes that we're familiar with, the ingredients that we would use were often considered as the unwanted, the not, the, the, the waste, right? So you would have a dish called you would stew your peas. You would have peas, which you could grow easily, and both the um, the workers as well as um, the people that um, led led the farm, whether it was pre-slavery or post, right? They could. They everyone's eating peas, mm -hmm. but some people are seasoning their peas with like the best prime part of the um, of the of the meat. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the, um, the lower class or, you know, folks, if it was, um, during slavery, the enslaved were using things like pigtail. Right. So it's like, well, I'm gonna, you can, you guys can't have all the nice ideal parts, but I'll give you the pigtail. Mm -hmm. And you say, um, oh my gosh, that's so, um, you know, terrible, etc. But don't worry, because if there's ever something that we can make do with it, they will they will make do with it. You, been, you the, mentioned the creativity and the use of, of any mm -hmm. food um, earlier. Yeah. That's and it, that, it, it's interesting to hear that. And so yeah. so how how would pigtail have been used back then? You said like to season the peas or yes. Mm -hmm. So um, and it's not and that's what I'm. Um, it's not even a back then, right? So you, this is something that I would make last week. Okay. Um, so you would take the, um, the pigtail, you would put it into a brine of salt water, which then kind of, you know, it, um, it pickles it, right? Mm -hmm. And so now, again, with the refrigerator, you, you, you can't put it in the fridge. You don't have a place to store it. Um, and so you put it in this salt water, also very accessible. Mm -hmm. And um, you can use it over time. You mm -hmm. can use a small piece, a big piece, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you would maybe some people, whatever dish you're making, the fat from that would be used as um, lard, right? Mm -hmm. To just melt it, flavor it would it would it would, season, cook with. Mm -hmm. it would flavor the pot. It would season the pot. Other times it would be more of a um, you leave it in your dish and let it cook down and mm -hmm. simmer and stew with the item, mm -hmm. and it would still add flavor mm -hmm. um, and probably some sense of fullness because fat adds a lot of. Um, fullness and to, to meals too yeah and those are the like that kind of like science around the nutrition are things that you don't you don't understand while you're eating it right but I guess not that you know but you know how you feel after right like there's right. a sense of having a full belly versus not and so I imagine there was some organic kind of uh, process around selecting food and adding foods or um, and it's really interesting because it's like just to think of like stretching a pigtail and like the, 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 you know, and using that multiple yeah. times and using the lard and how inventive that was. And yeah. then to also like, it's really fascinating as I think about my own education in nutrition and how lacking it was in really understanding the roots of these foods. I mean, yeah, we got a, like a superficial high level um, overview of different cultures and what the, yeah. the foods were that were native to those parts of the world and just, you know, different, but we didn't really get a full understanding as to like, like how they came about and mm -hmm. how like deeply connected people are to their cultural cuisines. And I'm thinking about that as like, you know, I was trained to help people learn how to cook their collard greens healthier, like, yeah. you know, by taking like the ham hock out or whatever, but like, that is so like such a deep part of that culture um and so it sounds like similarly like the pigtail and other these pieces that are rooted in you know in slavery yeah. i mean in that 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 really it, it really connects you to those those people mm -hmm. that you know that lived with your ancestors and um so i think that's really... i'm thinking that um another thing that as you're um reading and and talking to other clients about mm -hmm. the um the history of bananas Mm -hmm. would really be something that um, would be uh, interesting for you to, 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 to delve more into, delve into some more. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, bananas were actually like a form of currency at one point. Really? Because of how much they were traded um, throughout the world. 
And um, the places that these things were growing in, um, the people that had to reap them, carry them, you know, produce them, et cetera, were, you know, our men mostly, um, um, you know, um, um, and the, for a long time, these things, these, these, they were being done without some of the kind of um, sprays and, and all these, you know, products that do things at today. Yeah, and, to control pests and things like that. Right, right, right. And even yeah. once they were introduced, they were still, um, you know, the main way that they were carried, cut, and, and moved in and out of the, where they grew were just by people carrying them. And one of the things that, um, especially over the pandemic, we did a lot more of was eating. Um, typically in my culture, we would have, we, we boil green bananas. And that mm. is, um, you know, something that we would use to accompany any of our dishes that would have um, a, um, a meat or mm. a fish and, some, and you have your sauce and mm. the, the, the gravy is what helps to flavor the green banana. So does and, it, you, do you boil it with the skin on? Or... Um, so I, and, uh, many, many years ago, um, people, as people still do it to this day, they would boil it with the skin on, with a mm -hmm. slit, they would cut a slit in it, mm -hmm. so that um, once it's expanding, you know, the skin would peel off. I personally don't boil it with the skin on because there's just way too many um, outside factors uh, mm -hmm. introduced to... Um, oh, right, with on the skin and everything. Yes, right? yes. So um, I, I've, I've discontinued that, but definitely um, I have done that and I'm sure people still do that to this day. Mm -hmm. But um, we, I think the gen a lot of the population thinks of like yellow ripe bananas as being so nutritious and, and as a fruit and it's healthy and it looks beautiful. And they actually don't know about like something like a green banana and how that can be used. Mm -hmm. um, recently I started seeing that they're using them and making chips mm -hmm. and um, frying. Well, Thing. Yeah, and interestingly, I think there is a difference in sugar content. Like when the, the banana ripens, there's more sugar, it's sweeter. Um, and, you know, certainly, I mean, if anyone's got diabetes or right. um, any health conditions where that's a concern or, you know, just I think with popular culture, that's been something that like sugar's mm -hmm. been on the radar. But, um, and, and so I wonder if that there's been a trend towards, oh, you know, eating the fruit when, it, fruit when it's less ripe for that reason. Yeah. Right, right, right. Someone just posted something, let's see, access of lack there too of healthy foods in urban areas has been has to be combated yeah maintaining but i mean maintaining integrity of cooking and food prep in home mm -hmm. yeah yeah i agree yeah there are definitely food deserts and certain that's such that's a huge issue you know and um you know having access to healthy foods access to a variety of foods um that you know and it's and I, you know, like you mentioned, um, I think um, Kamala, you had mentioned that connection to poverty. So I'm, I'm thinking that maybe that's, um, I'm not sure if you know who this, I don't want to say her name wrong. Yeah. It's, it's her. Um, so I see the comments about, can we talk about Pepper? Um, yeah. <laughs> Amy, you want to go there? Um, Do I want to go there? Why? <laughs> so I get, I don't, I mean, I think um, well, Pepper is very, <laughs> you know, it's very, um, integral to um, cooking in, in my culture and um, um, habanero peppers is um, kind of the pepper of choice. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I, um, it's, I've seen is um, we're very particular and, and almost in a competitive sense on if you're making a homemade pepper sauce, whose homemade pepper sauce is the better? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so is it is it the more the spicier or the more heat the better or is it dependent? It's flavor. Okay. It's about the flavor. So um, the heat is is nice, but your heat has to be combined with um, a nice flavor as well. Okay. Um, so this is where like the you know you'd have the spicy pepper, but then are you adding some um, onions, vinegar, um, uh, bell peppers, blah blah blah. Um, are you pimento, also mm -hmm. known as allspice, you know, yeah. do you grind it? Do you, and all of these things. <laughs> it, um, it reminds me of like these, um, you know, like uh, barbecue, big yeah. barbecue contest people have. Yeah. So is it, and what, what would these um, items be that you'd be seasoning? Um, <laughs> so, <Or anything>. um, 
if you if you have it if you you have it and you bottled it then you're putting it on everything right? okay. okay um but if you are just talking in general um this this is how we came about jamaica is known for a jerk seasoning jerk chicken um, or, yeah mm -hmm. yeah so it's really just it's a seasoning that um and and the process of how you are cooking and smoking that mm -hmm. food that dish that you're making mm -hmm. but the, the the part that's essential to it is the flavor of mm -hmm. that of mm -hmm. the spice mm -hmm. but um i think that it's so it we actually like between my sisters and my brother and i it's kind of funny because um i might just be making um something a dish that i love is called ma pao tofu mm -hmm. it's um I, it's something that I learned and, and bought and, and about a lot when I was um, living overseas. And so I, I think if you, when I love something, I'm going to figure out how to make it. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's one thing, another dishes, or I'll make like a, a nice uh, pad thai. Mm -hmm. um, I'll make a good like um, curry chicken. Mm -hmm. And all of those things, I'm always laughing at myself because I seem to like Jamaicanize it. Because I end up adding a sauce that is not a, a pepper sauce that is not relevant to a Thai dish, uh -huh. um, because I still want that sense of like home. Yeah, I and guess. there's a flavor component you're looking for, yeah. right? It's like yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's really yeah. It is interesting how there are these foods that conjure up such a sense of nostalgia, like you know, mm -hmm. and. I was I was going to ask you that if you have a, a food that's just like home for you that you just think of like it reminds you of your childhood. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'll, let me start with um, my kids. They will another one thing that conjures up that sense of um, family for them is um, soup, mm. and they'll say to me, "Mom, are you making this your soup your way, or are you making it grandma's way?" So they want grandma soup. Mm -hmm. um, that that it has a certain thickness to it. It has a certain flavor. Like mm -hmm. that, it's just you, you know, it's hard to replicate. Mm -hmm. And um, as try and try as I might to do it the way that grandma does, they're like, oh, this is pretty good. But, <laughs> you know. Um, so um, you know, mommy soup might be a little bit um, on the. Um, more modern side yeah. of things, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that for me conjures up, um, like, a, like feels like a big warm hug is plantain porridge. Mm, that sounds delicious. Um, Someone just mentioned porridge, actually. Okay. Yeah. There's so many types, right? You can make porridge out of um, cornmeal. You can mm -hmm. make it out of oats. Um, but even um, definitely when I was pregnant, I love um plantain porridge it just feels like my great grandmothers are with me and um you know i love that i have a husband that can make it for me uh, i love that like the generativity of food like <laughs> just being passed down from one generation to the next and that that connection um it's, it's really it is it's it's wonderful to have those and to be able to have your mom pass down recipes that mm -hmm. her mom passed down to her or um and actually that kind of makes me wonder in your family i mean i know you, you know you're married you've got kids and your your husband is also jamaican am i correct okay that's right. so does he cook as well or is that more your domain um that's he does cook as well uh -huh. thank goodness and uh, <laughs> we have um we, we kind of like, you know, joke a little bit that um, he does a lot more of the traditional cooking and I'll introduce a lot of the, um, you know, a dish from anywhere that I've been or anything I'm interested in. And, yeah. and, and I can just kind of make things up off on the, on the fly. Yeah. Um, and he can replicate Consi with consistency dishes from our childhood. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so you might add in like a little bit of an Asian twist or something. Or, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, you know, he's like, oh, what is this? This looks interesting. You know, I'm adding, um, you know, there's like extra cilantro on something and, you know, like, oh, did you know that you could do this with, um, uh, um, you know, uh, like lettuce wraps and spring yeah. rolls and, but doing them from scratch. Um, the other, and since February, one of the things that we've been doing is making sushi. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And um, that's my, impressive. I, I've always wanted to make sushi, and I even have all the all the equipment, and I've just never I've never done it. So I'm impressed. It's, it's so doable. I was intimidated as well. And I thought I had to buy all of the, um, the, uh, the, you know, accoutrements that you need. Yeah, yeah. Bamboo. No, you really just remember that, you know, it's about taste and feel, you know, being fulfilled and having a good time while you're making something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you just so can't true. go, you know, I, you, there's very little ways that you can go wrong with that. That's a good point. It's like that experience of making it and then eating it. I mean, making it before, you know, adds such another element of enjoyment and yeah. shared connection around the food. And it makes a good, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, so we are running out of time, but I wanted to just go back. You'd mentioned something about, which sounded delightful, like these days, something that reminds you a lot of like what you would do with your family growing up in terms of like sharing meals, potluck, as we would call it that you know like play games and I'm wondering is that your is that your family like your or your neighborhood or like what um um that is um definitely my family and mm -hmm. um it's one of the things that I miss the most about um living um a, a fair distance away from the majority of my family mm -hmm. and um as a result I've had to uh, make my friend I have had to bring my friends into this um <laughs> this relationship and this culture i'm sure they don't and mind <laughs> so far so good so yeah. far so good um and you know one of the ways that i tried to maintain that um, except for last year was um during the holidays especially um and it's really like a period of time because i have such an eclectic group of friends of various um faiths ethnicities um and ex you know so I just would say like during the, the late November, mm -hmm. during the, um, you know, late December, um, early new year timeframe, I love to invite people over and um, I would make um, a lot of my dishes that I associate with that time of the year. Mm -hmm. And for some, it's like a new introduction and um, for others, it's like, oh, yes, you know, I've been missing this. Like, thanks mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. doing that. And and then also kind of mix it up with something that um, that uh, maybe if it's um, someone that's new to this, I, <laughs> don't worry. Someone said I'm waiting for an invitation. I know that it's coming. <laughs> um, well, you know, COVID has made it really challenging. I imagine it's been a loss. If that's, yeah. some, if that's part of something you enjoy, like entertaining, having people over. Yeah. Yeah, sharing and, food, you know, <laughs> and also, you know, um, and then having something for the for the kids, and mm -hmm. uh, which is also a new concept. Mm -hmm. Growing up, we didn't have like this is for the kids. Oh, right? I didn't it's, either. Yeah, <laughs> you, ate, you, you ate what was in front of you, yeah. and um, that's a really um, been something that we've continued in our house. Which yeah. is, um, although there's like you know, now, now one of our children has allergies to particular food subset, but, um, there is, you're, you, you're, we're, I'm trying to create an openness mm -hmm. to, to try different things. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, um, the best way to help them try them is for them to have a hand in making it or buying Absolutely. it or, Absolutely. you know, yeah. or even a hand in picking it. I know you spend a lot of time at the farm and, I know yeah. that's how I got my son to try eggplant. We went and picked eggplant. Yeah. We went home made, made eggplant parmesan, and it was he. I, I can't. It was around three years old. I can't imagine that a three year old would just walk into a plate of eggplant parmesan and say, "Oh, that right. looks <laughs> that looks interesting." But um, right. I, I love it. So it, it sounds like you really um, are trying to pass on a lot of the values, a lot of the culture that you grew up with around food, and mm -hmm. uh, and that you're, you're, you're creating some openness for your kids to explore and try new things. And it does take like 15 to 20 times often for kids to try something yeah. before they accept it. So, you know, don't, you know, I always tell people like, keep, it, keep putting it on the plate. And sometimes you want, you know, make sure you serve something that you know they're going to eat. Right. But um, I think that's great. And I, you know, this has been really really amazing I feel like I, I've learned so much and I, I do want to make sure to have you share some of those places that you that are local that people can shop because I want to make sure to give them some I mean give them a little bit of a shout out and also let people know where they can go um and someone just said my mom called everything chicken because I you know it's so funny I have a story about that so I grew up in Maine and my dad um 
uh, much to my dismay, had gone hunting one year. He wasn't a big hunter, but he went and he, he, got, he got a deer. And uh, I, I guess that, that year we ate deer meat all winter and they kept telling me it was steak. And it didn't taste like steak to me. Right. And it kept it got gamier and gamier and gamier as the season went on. And I remember I overheard my mom telling my grandmother, "Oh yeah, we keep telling Amy it's steak, but it's really deer meat." And I like lost it. I was. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, no, don't don't feel bad. I think that that has happened here as well. Um, we have learned how to fish um, mm -hmm. probably since the five or so years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, we went camping with a family, or I think it was two or three families went camping. Uh, my kids and I and my husband, we caught fish. And my son was super excited. The couple that we were there with were like, oh, that's awesome. You guys caught a fish. And it was a nice size. But they didn't realize, like, oh, like, y'all are, like, really hardcore, like, Jamaican, Jamaican. So, of course, we're at a campsite. You take the fish. He has uh, served his life, and we brought him to the uh, pot. You know, we, we, of course, we cleaned him off. Yeah, you know, you, we, this is the things that we learned how to do um, as a child. You learn how to scale the fish, which is basically cleaning off the scales. You learn how to wash it, gut it. Yeah. And um, that's what we had for lunch that afternoon. Yeah. And... Um, I think it's, I mean, it was that. I think I, that's a really authentic kind of like, uh, you know, kind of chain of. Um, so it says the cycle of life. Cycle of life, food chain. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of like, and to be able to actually like have that ritual around it. But we're so disconnected now for the most part around from our food and like where it comes from. And it's, you know, and it, it you know, I think like to the point where some kids don't know that applesauce comes from apples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know? yeah. um, so I think it's, I really appreciate the, the, that you're, you're bringing those, those values into your family. And I think there's food is such a sensory experience, right? Full sensory experience and mm -hmm. having that experience to be it, like be in the food and cook it and taste mm -hmm. and um, feel it, touch it and is so valuable. And it's going to create like a nice, I think you're, you, like you said, an open relationship for them. Yeah. So is there any last thing you want to say before we wrap up? I don't want to. Yeah, um, I just want to thank you for um, coordinating this series. I think it's so important that um, we have conversations like this because especially as a, you know, in the field that you work with uh, mm -hmm. as a nutritionist, um, I think it's important that um, all cultures um, feel that they have um, uh, support when they're trying mm -hmm. to make decisions that are going to um, help their you know, their health, mm -hmm. right? And to be making sure that you have a lens where you can incorporate a person's um, food culture mm -hmm. into what you are recommending for mm -hmm. them to maybe modify, adjust, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it, really, it really helps um, folks to feel seen. Like you mm -hmm. don't have to get rid of things that are um, a part of your history and culture for you to be, um, on a kind of a, 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 a nutrition or health journey that's going to work for you. Right. Uh, and so I agree, I, you, know, th you know, and I agree. Thank you. I mean, this has been so informative to me and I know everyone else that's been watching and will watch. And that's part of the reason I wanted to host this series is to help generate some awareness, get these discussions going. And I think we can, mm -hmm. not only is it important as like, you know, a dietitian in the field to have this understanding of food from a cultural perspective, but also it's a great way to explore, explore culture. I think just looking at food, it ties to so many pieces of our culture. And, right. um, and I think it's something we can all connect around, right? We all have mm -hmm. to eat and we all have a relationship with food. So Thank you so much. This has been so great. And I, um, you know, anyone that's watching, we have a whole slew of people coming up that are going to be really, really um, great. Like we have, um, so Jamie Dannenberg will be on tonight and she's going to speak from her perspective, having worked at Smock and framing him. So, you know, with the social determinants of health. And she's also um, a huge advocate for the queer community and can speak about the, the intersection between our food and body image culture and that population, particularly speaking to the tra about the trans population. And then we've got Lena Dugdale, who's going to come tomorrow and talk about being from a mixed racial background and some of her, you know, experiences around managing some medical issues with herself and her kids. And then we've got... Um, 
uh, let's see, Jennifer DeLeon, who's just, who's just launched another book, White Space. She's going to be coming on next week to talk from like the Latinx perspective. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this just, and, and, you know, if anyone feels compelled in there, maybe if there's anyone from a Brazilian background that wants to jump on at some point, I'd love to have you, um, anyone from an Asian background that can speak more to that. Um, um, any, me any men we haven't I don't have any men yeah. lined up except I do have Jay Petruno he's coming on yeah. but yeah <laughs> I would also um, um, like to also just kind of like make a as the weather is getting warmer all throughout the country and all the different parts like I'm definitely a proponent of um, trying to encourage more people to grow their own mm -hmm. food just take a hand in it whether you start with just your herbs um, some sm you know, a small indoor um, garden and then maybe work your way outside. Mm -hmm. um, that's also been a great um, lesson in how, where our food comes from, mm -hmm. what it tastes like, you know, because by the time it ends up in your supermarket, you're actually sometimes missing what it actually tastes like. Mm -hmm. And you lose um, some of the nutrition too. And that, that, that's mm -hmm. part of it too. So um, I see that someone joins here, um, Mike Morgan, um, he has something that maybe you you two would be great at talking about. Um, so I would love to see um, he's working on a, a, a direct to home kind of starter kit for mm -hmm. um, planting your own um, garden. So that's definitely something that I, I'm yeah, a fan definitely. of. Definitely, I'd love to connect with you, Mike, if you're on here, so. Mm -hmm. Shoot me a message or an email. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and one more thing I just wanted to mention. So there's um, a, an organization that I volunteer at called Boston Alliance to Diversify Dietetics. It's bad. And they are having a cooking series um, this month and into April. And there's actually going to be an, uh, another Jamaican dietitian joining me later in this series. And she's going to be cooking a uh, Jamaican tofu, I'm um, jerk tofu, sorry. And um, there is, you'll you can see in our stories, I think that all the, all the dates for those are, um, are listed. And Sue Ellen will join us to, to share a little bit more about that. So if, if anyone wants to learn how to make jerk tofu, you're welcome to join, um, go over and check out BAD. Um, it's, I, I think, at BAD Dietetics is the handle. Awesome. So thank you everyone for joining. And I will definitely um, post this on our Yay. on our our page all right, all right. thank you kamali it was so good to talk to you all right thanks everyone for joining all right let's see if i can